All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Thank you for being here. Those of you online, thank you. Uh, let's pray. Let's take a moment to pray together and start. Can somebody please lead us in prayer? We could. All right, we are actually in the in our last lesson on the signs of the end times. So the purpose of this course, one was to give us a good overview of the timeline, the sequence of events of the end times. So we will revise that, but I want us to be clear that this is the sequence, why we say that, and how we answer common questions uh, around that sequence. Why do you say that after is going to happen before the tribulation and so on? So I want us to be clear on that. And the next important thing for us in this course is to recognize some of the signs that are telling us that we are very close to the end. Okay. Of course, nobody can give a date. Nobody can say, oh, this date is this. People have tried that. Uh, nothing has worked. But at least we know we are close. We are coming close. Okay. So what are some of the signs? We have looked at a few. We will look at some more today. So on page 78 in your notes, uh, I'll just quickly review some other things we already saw. Number one, that uh, Israel being formed as a nation. That was very important. Because without that, many prophecies would not be able to be fulfilled. So that was a, that's like, it's like the signal and they started. And come to the end, or the beginning of the end. So that was very important for us to know. And also, uh, what the Lord Jesus said is one generation will see everything. Of course, we don't know what generation means. How many years? Are they 40 or 80 or 120? So, somewhere in that range, one generation will see everything. Second is about Jerusalem itself. It is becoming a place of conflict. And even today, now, now present time, Jerusalem, Israel, Israel and Jerusalem are in the news all the time. So the fact that Jerusalem has become a place of it's fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It's a build up towards the end battle of Then number three, page 18, the Temple Mount. And people are ready to rebuild the temple. So that is also an important side because a lot of the things that have to do with the Antichrist has to do with the temple. Huh? Which is not, sorry, one minute. What happened? Uh, check, check. Can online people hear my audio? Hello, check, check. Hmm? Sorry, uh, my audio. My audio. Yes, I didn't make that change. Should be better now. Okay, thank you. Let's continue. All right, so thank you. 
the third thing we were saying is the temple temple has to be ready temple mount right because um, a lot of what the antichrist is going to do is connected to the temple first he is going to let the sacrifices resume so there has to be a temple middle of the seven years he'll come and say stop and he'll put himself up as god so you have to worship me yeah. so for all of that this temple mount has to be there and uh, as we see that you know there are certain jews who have made all the preparations who are ready to do it i'm not saying every jewish person don't stop some jew and say hey you want the temple <laughs> some jews won't care and they are living in their own world we're talking about the fundamental jews the you know those who are really serious about this they have made preparations okay number four is the part of what daniel had prophesied he talked about 10 leaders 10 horns the lord had shown daniel who will come emerge from what used to be the former Roman Empire, which covers today, overlaps with a lot of modern day Europe. So from that region, there'll be 10 leaders of 10 nations. And there will be a little horn, which is a, a small leader coming. He will influence three of them. And with their help, he will come into power. So that with all of that is in place in the sense it's ready. You know, there are those 10 actually more than 10 nations in the European Union that we are looking at and so any of these 10 leaders can uh, who are very prominent leaders can then help uh, bring up this this small leader and put him into power so that's also in place number five which we spoke of last week is that today we are living in a time when it is possible to have a global system for currency and even a, a, and a, a global currency and identification system. These are two things that will happen when the Antichrist comes to power. Right? This Revelation 13. Without receiving his number, you cannot buy and sell. You cannot transact. You cannot do financial things without receiving the mark of the beast. So he said, we are living in a time when something like that can be fulfilled. Which, like we said, maybe even 30 years ago, was not possible. Very difficult. But we are living in a time, it's possible. Globally, it can be correct. So even that sign is, uh, is uh, you know, is, 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 is ready to happen. It can be implemented. So we stop there. Let's go forward. Number six. So one of the major prophecies, so if you turn with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 38. Um, even as we recognize that Israel has a very important um, part to play, Jerusalem has a very important part to play, so we are looking at Israel, we are looking at Jerusalem. There is also this very interesting prophecy. In Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel has the vision of the dry bones, uh, which is speaking prophetically about God bringing all the, bringing the Jewish people back to their own land. God saying, I will bring you back, I will establish you in your own land. That is chapter 37, which today we say has been fulfilled. Israel is there. People are there. They have their own identity. They have their own land. But in chapter 38, uh, Ezekiel is describing another situation, uh, which is to take place. But he also mentions names of tribes and regions that are very, very interesting. We can recognize them. 
uh, I, I won't read the whole chapter, but I, we will just pick up some verses and uh, you know you can read the whole chapter uh, to see what he's saying. But let's look at it. For, you know, uh, we'll just read from verse one onwards, uh, and I'll jump around in, in a few verses. Ezekiel thirty-eight. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, "Son of man, set your face against Gog, of the land of Magog." the prince of Rosh, Mishael, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. So people say, okay, what is Gog and Magog? Well, then he identifies the leader of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So, again, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a person who studies tribes and anthropology and all, but people who study that, Say that Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal are tribes that are now part of Russia, living in Russia. So Gog and Magog has to do with reference to certain parts or certain regions of Russia, because he's talking about Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, these tribes. Okay, so we learn, we, we take it from people who understand uh, that. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I'll turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So that means he's talking about an army coming from Gog and Magog, Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cause you to come like a big army from this region. And then he says, verse 4, oh, sorry, verse 5 Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togorma, far. From the far north, all of its troops, many people are with you. So now he's identifying other regions. Persia is the old name for Iran. Okay. So until recently, they were known as Persia. That region was known as Persia until they renamed to Iran. So Persia, Ethiopia, we know, north uh, part of Africa, Libya. Goma and all its troops, the house of Togorma. So, uh, let me see here. Um, Togorma is a uh, referring, reference to Turkey. Turkey. From the far north. So, Turkey is right north of Israel. Okay? Togorma. Uh, Goma, I'm not really sure. I have to look it up. Uh, so again, it must, it must be another tribe, another group. Turkey, I remember, it's uh, Togorma, I remember, it refers to Turkey, north. Many people are with you. Verse 7. So all these people are joining together. They're joining together with Russia. So how Russia is relating to Iran, Turkey, is, is useful for us to think about. Because here he's talking. These people are all joining together. So today, look, how are these nations aligning themselves? And what's happening? Verse 7, prepare yourself and be, be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you. Be a guard for them. After many days, you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. So in the latter years, Ezekiel is talking about sometime in the future. What will happen? He says, all of you will come towards these people who have been gathered. The Jews, right? they have been gathered. They have, they have suffered violence. They have suffered so much. right? They have suffered a lot. They have come back to the mountains of Israel, which long had been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So we are in that situation. Israel? 
people have brought, been brought from all the nations. They are dwelling in their own lands. But while these people are dwelling in their own, own land, Gog and Magog, you know, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, Persia, Togorma, uh, Ethiopia, Libya, all of you will join together and you will come against Israel. Okay, so he's, he's, he's already said, in the latter years, you're going to do this. Okay. You will ascend, coming like a storm, verse 9, you will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. Okay, so they're going to come, right? Uh, let's read on a little bit, it's quite interesting. It says here, verse 10, Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass, that thoughts will arise in your minds, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited, and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, and merchants of Tarshish, and all the young lions will say to you, Have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away life livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord, On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Though you will come from your place out of the far north. So that's again, verse 15. Again, a very important clue. North of Jerusalem, far north of Jerusalem is Moscow. Straight line, straight line. Far north of Jerusalem is Moscow. So he's saying, you'll come from the far north. While my people, Israel, are dwelling safely, they are living, they have built, built up their own houses, etc., etc., they're living, you will come. Verse 15, then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days, again, latter days, that I will bring you against my land, so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Thus says the Lord, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days, that I would bring you against them? So, it's very clear. Russia, along with some other allies, like Iran, some uh, Ethiopia, Libya, some others will join together, will come against Israel. But when you read through chapter 39, what will happen is Israel will be able to push them back. Israel will not be, will not be captured, will not be conquered. Push them back. Right? So then they will uh, uh, regroup and then they will attack again. They'll try to attack. So that that that's so there is this buildup with Russia moving in, Israel pushing them back, and then we read about the you know that will lead that buildup will lead to the eventual what we could say you know all nations getting involved, which we read about you know Revelation 19, the Battle of Armageddon. So we are looking. So we are looking. So this is point number five. And we know in, in Revelation 16, he talks about the armies of the kings of the east coming in. They'll also join in. So we are look, our interest are looking is how, uh, how is Russia, Turkey, Iran, China? How are they aligning themselves? And today, we can say very clearly, China and Russia are very, you know, you refer to them as superpowers or big influential powers, political powers in the world. 
On the other hand, you have the United States, you have the European Union, you have other countries that are aligned. But you can see that Russia, China, are having building good relationships, not only with each other, but also with Turkey, Iran, with those countries. China has extended its influence almost, almost across Africa by offering to build infrastructure and railroad and all those things in many countries in Africa. So they already come in and establish their presence and Russia is having good relations, I mean, building that relationship with China. So we look at these interactions. Now, we know what's happened in the last couple of years when Russia has attacked Ukraine, trying to, you know, take over. And of course, other countries are supporting and helping Ukraine defend itself and reclaim their own land and protect themselves and so on. Um, but it's like Iran has been supplying ammunition to Russia. Okay, I'll give you weapons, you fight. You know, so it's behind all those things happening. Iran has been supplying ammunition to Palestinians, the Lebanese, uh, the Yemen rebels, and so on. So against Israel. So they're not directly coming, but they're helping others. So it's kind of interesting to see all this happening. Because these countries have been mentioned or referenced here in chapter 38. Yeah. And for this to be fulfilled, now of course, Ezekiel said in the latter days, in the latter times. So we know it's it's out in the future. For that to happen, what we can say is today's political situation is actually moving towards fulfilling the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38. It's actually moving in that direction. You know, it's it's it's, it's amazing that Ezekiel would, of course, with the by the power of the Holy Spirit, could prophesy and say all this in his day. Right. So keep so we keep an eye on the news see basically how these main countries and of course smaller countries will be joining in how they are joining together because this will actually build up towards the battle of Armageddon. any questions clear yeah. yeah so pastor like uh so in uno will play any role on this like there is an organization to mm. among the unity among the nation. So UNO will play anything for this. Right. So I think the role of the UN, which we will see in point number seven. Of course, the United Nations, their goal is to, you know, kind of like oversee all the nations. We all live in peace and live peacefully and do things that are good for everyone. But they cannot force anything. Like they can't jump in and stop Russia from. They can only speak. They can give advice, give counsel, have meetings. <laughs> and yeah, sometimes they send troops and people aid and all of those kinds of things, kinds of things. But they also have to be careful. What we can see, and we will come to when we point number seven is that the United Nations is playing or is taking a position, let us try to bring peace to these conflicts, Israel and Palestinians. How? Mainly by telling Israel, Israel, in a nice way, you give the land to the Palestinians. Let them have the land. You live peacefully, you give them the land. and don't build settlements on their land. So Israel has continued to keep building its own settlements, villages, everything on the, that land. 
United Nations will always keep issuing letters, orders. Please don't. We don't recognize this. Don't do it. Israel keeps building. But they're trying to bring peace. But their approach is, Israel, you have to give up your lands. Give up your land to them. Israel says, why should we? You know? So even though the United Nations is a big body, and of course, a lot of it operates on based on who votes for what, you know, they try to be very democratic in the process. Uh, you can see that in point number seven. Right? Let's look at that. So the other point number seven, next sign is, and Joel prophesied about this. Uh, let's let's uh, read that. Joel chapter three, verse one and two. Joel said, for behold, this is on page 82, Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. So God is saying, now he spoke to the prophet Joel, say, hey, I am going to bring the nations here. This is the valley of Joseph. This is basically the valley of Megiddo, this final battle of Armageddon. Nations are going to come. I'm going to judge them. Why? They have divided up my land. And when you look at what is happening, almost every proposal to bring peace to the Middle East is, Israel, you give them their land, you stay this side. Divide the land, basically. Let them, you give. Let them live, you know, uh, there are two parts to it. They're on the West Bank, on Gaza, you let them stay there. You give the land and you stay elsewhere on the other side. That is the solution. But Israel refuses. So ultimately, Joel said, they are going to come. And they've come to divide up the land. And God says, I will step in. I will judge the nations. So this is one, you know, that when you look at uh, just every every past American president who has attempted to bring peace, many resolutions passed by the United Nations, even I a proposal submitted by the European Union. Everybody says, please. Israel, we are recommending you give their land, you divide the land. You know, that is the way the approach to peace. And this has been going on for a few decades. Uh, but it's not going to happen. Israel will, it's very difficult for Israel to give up their land. And the second. Of course, second point of conflict, which we are uh, very aware of, is the city of Jerusalem itself, where the Temple Mount is. Right? Yeah, to some extent, uh, after the 1967 war, when Israel recaptured, they captured the whole city of Jerusalem. They captured everything back. But in order to maintain peace, they said, OK, Jordan, neighboring country Jordan, you manage the worshippers who come and go to the mosque and the, that, uh, the, the, the Dome of the Rock. You manage that. OK, it is you know, your religious, you manage that. But we have control over the city of Jerusalem. We have control. We have captured it. So there is that always that tension, you know, especially now, like during the time of Ramadan even now. So this year, there is even more tension because 
of the attack by the Palestinians from Gaza, right? October the attack. So that 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 war or that fighting is still going on. But now it's the holy month coming up. I think it must have started or is starting now Ramadan. So the Muslims want Arabs, they want to come and worship there, pray there. But too much tension. What if something happens? You know, so it's a very very delicate, volatile situation. Of course, there are other governments like the United States and other countries. But nobody can bring a solution. They can say some nice things. But nobody is able to bring a solution as of now. So we are looking at that, you know. Everybody, every proposal is divide the land, give them, live peaceful. But that is the very thing. Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Joel prophesied the nations will come against Israel, almost like forcing them to give the land. And that will, you know, that will lead to this battle. Final battle, Armageddon. And God says, I will judge the nations. So right now it's only talk, it's only proposal. But I think a time will come when uh, end of the tribulation. So all that happens during the tribulation is going to build up towards this. So, uh, the reason I, I heard about this, the reason organization which all the countries in the world like like they, in the unity there will be there is a head for it and then now recently russia is out of it so like i don't know that name i forgot but like something like that organization or like the head they can't do anything about these issues they can't make them sit and speak like if something is happening in our states there is one president like that. Um, I mean, the only organization that we can think of right now which could do something is the United Nations. But there it's very it's one it's 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 supposed it's a democratic process, meaning, yeah, like you said, we will try to sit and talk. But if people don't want to agree, you can't force anything. You know? Uh, and then a lot of things will happen by vote. How many support? How many don't support? Some people say we don't vote. <laughs> we don't want to say this side or that side. So it's a democratic process. So they're not able to actually find a resolution. You can't force anything. They can try to, you know, they call it through diplomatic relations. Okay, let us sit and talk and please come and talk and you know, like that. They try to but nothing nothing's gonna happen. Right? But it what is interesting is Joel already said they're coming to divide up my land. Until now, the only solution is a two I mean only proposal that has been coming out is a two-state solution. You have to give both this side, this side, you all live peacefully. Right? There's been no other proposal right, for solution. So it's interesting because it's very aligned to what Joel already prophesied. This is what's going to happen. Number eight. While all that is happening in the world, something also has to happen to the church. Because Paul, the apostle in Ephesians, he said something about the church. He said, you know, the Lord has given prophets, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and they're all going to do their work. And they're going to do their work in order to bring us, bring the church to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Right? So the church has to come to this place 
of the full measure of the stature of Christ. In the sermon Acts 3, Peter said that Jesus Christ must, literally this means, you know, it says whom heaven must receive or whom heaven must retain, Acts 3.21. That means Jesus will be held in heaven until the time for the restoration of all things. Which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophet. So you can understand in two ways. That is, until there is, a, there is the restoration of all things, or until the time comes for all things to be restored. So that until there is. So when you look at it the first way, that means the church itself has to be restored, which has happened. The church has gone through a great journey of restoration. It is coming to this place of maturity. And Paul again in Ephesians 5, he said that the Lord will present her to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. So the church that Jesus is coming back for is a fully restored, mature, glorious church. So we have to observe, see what, what is happening in the church. And we can see very clearly, in the last about 400 years, starting towards the end of the 16th century, you know, uh, there has been this whole journey of reformation. And the church has come to a place today where it is, it has understood, uh, uh, you know, who the church is, its place as the body of Christ, and so on. You know, uh, the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, even all those offices have been restored. They were not there. If you see about 500 years ago, the church was in a, in a dark state. There was no preaching and teaching, but much preaching and teaching of the gospel. But in just about 400 years or so, so much has happened. Right? So the Lord has accelerated the work, the restoration of all things in the church. It's happened. And He's bringing us to a place to be a glorious church. So that's another sign. Yeah, we're getting close to the Lord returning. He's coming back for a glorious church. Number nine, the gospel to all the nations. This we all already seen. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, one of the signs, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. So the word nations there is ethne, people, groups. You know, so um, in terms of nations, as we understand politically, yes, it's gone to all the nations. But Jesus said ethne, meaning people, groups. So we are going one level lower and saying, okay, almost, I, I, I don't know exact number we could see, maybe online in Joshua Project will tell us, you know, this is the way we are. We're, we're, they say, like, we're now to the last mile. Last mile, we have only so many people groups to be reached. Otherwise, the gospel has literally gone to every tribe and tongue and nation. Is gone, only a few left. Right? So, even from that perspective, we're coming close to the end. And the gospel has gone into all the nations and it is reaching all the people groups. We're very close. Because Jesus said, then the end will come. Some of the other uh, science which we have read in yes, go ahead. Pastor, does it mean like uh, there is no one on the earth that 
that they, they doesn't know about Jesus. Like everyone, at least one time in their life, they'll hear about Jesus. Mm, no. So he didn't say like every person. He said every people group. That means the gospel will reach every people group. So it doesn't mean every individual has to hear. It means it has to reach every people group. That means like you can say, you say people group meaning every tribe. Okay. Uh, it has to reach everyone, every uh, people group. So it doesn't mean every person has to hear. Okay. So for example, Oh. They have to hear, yeah. So that is why that last effort is being the effort is being made for the last mile. That means, example, the gospel has come to India. It has reached, I think, in every city in India, every town, almost every village. And we can't say every village has been reached, but almost. And almost from there, if you go out of the village, villages, then only next left is tribes. Some people living somewhere in some jungles, like far away, who have not been touched. So we are down to that level. We are down to. So has the gospel reached India? Yeah, reached India a long time ago as a nation. Covered every city, yeah. Every town, almost every town. Village. Now we are down to maybe which are the villages that haven't received the gospel? Which are the tribes, the tribal groups? So that can, you know, we can actually count and say, okay, this is where we are. So it doesn't mean every person in each village or every person in every group, tribal group, has to hear. But it will reach them. Even if it reaches one person or two people, it's reached that group. Because now it is their responsibility to share it. And generally, these groups are very small, you know, like maybe in a few hundreds of people or maybe a few thousands, that's it. So we are in that state. We have reached down to that level. Okay, let me just see online. There any questions? Any questions from online students? Any? Okay. Now a few other signs which we are familiar with, uh, because we have read them in Matthew twenty-four. In, in Luke 21, there will be increased persecution. Right? Jesus said, you know, they will lay hands on you, they will persecute you, they'll bring you before kings and rulers, but it's an opportunity for you to testify. So part of the signs that Jesus gave was there will be people who are persecuting you because of the name of Jesus. And there'll be increased persecution. And this is true. No, I mean, we can see it in our own country uh, as well as in other parts of the world. Even in the nations that once were called Christian nations, Christians are being persecuted for their faith. You know, may not necessarily be physical persecution, but the persecution or the attacks can come through other ways, you know, by. Uh, speaking against them, demeaning them, you know, calling them names and so on, um, the persecution. So there is this increased persecution. Another sign is increased deception, spiritualism and false spirituality. So Jesus said, you know, in fact, one of the first signs he said, be careful that nobody deceives you because many will come saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. So this, this whole thing about false Christs, people who claim to be anointed, who claim to have uh, you know, uh, who answers, um, they will deceive many. Uh, Paul also wrote in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, 
in the latter times people will depart from the faith. So in the latter times, things will happen. People will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. People will depart from the faith. And this is actually so shocking to see. In recent times, there have been pastors, I mean, I'm talking about from you know the Western world, pastors of mega churches say, I'm no longer a believer in Jesus. Like they have been pastoring churches of thousands of people. Suddenly something happens. Say, I'm no I'm not a follower of Jesus anymore. They write one big book, or they have written why I'm no longer following Jesus. And these are the people who once were pastors, they wrote books, uh, Christian books, or whatever, whatever, all that. Now suddenly something has happened in their life. They've renounced the faith and they have become like, you know, they call them humanists or, you know, just something. Uh, we just believe in humanity. That's it. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in Jesus. So people departing from the faith. In fact, a study was released not too long ago that in the last 30 years, more people, and this is again the Western world, more people have left the faith than who came to the faith in the revivals and through the preaching of Billy Graham and all those cru crusades. More people have left the faith in the last 30 years, the numbers, than those who came to the faith in the past revivals uh, and, and crusades. So Paul wrote about it. People will depart from the faith. They will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So this is happening our day and time, which means that for us to be believers, we have to be really serious. We have to take our faith seriously. We have to be very firm in our faith. Because there are these deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons that will flood the earth in this time. And it is happening. It's happening. We're seeing it happen. And it is quite disturbing. Right? So let's pause here. We'll go for a quick break. Come back and then we'll finish this up. We'll have some time for questions as well. Okay? So let's take a quick break and come back. And we'll continue after the break. All right. See you in 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 